In today's episode, you want the exact amount, you get the exact amount. Absolutely, we'll do that for you. Make sure the salad is well dressed. You got it. So let's get started. You want the exact amount, you get the exact amount. When I was 13 or 14, I decided I wanted a PS3. My dad refused to buy me one but my uncle made me an offer I couldn't refuse. He said that if I worked at his sweet shop for the two months of summer break, he would buy me a PS3 and some games in lieu of payment. For teenage me with no commitments, this seemed fantastic. My uncle sold a kind of specialty snack known as a mini samosa in his shop. They are like samosas, but smaller, about 3.5 to 4 centimeters in size, about 1-2286 of a football field for my American friends. They were sold by weight, in sealed packs of 250 GMS and 500 GMS as these were the most common amounts people bought. Making those packages turned out to be my job. You see, sometime between now and when uncle started his business, he realized that 250 GMS was roughly the weight of 28 mini samosas and thus 56 were 500 GMS. So instead of weighing each packet, I was told to just pack by counting individual items, which was easier and saved time. We also sold them individually for people who wanted larger, smaller or unusual amounts. This was also around the time when our government started airing customer awareness PSAs, Jago Brahak, Jago for my fellow Indians. Basically, just telling customers to beware of fraudulent business people. This is relevant. So, one particularly hot afternoon, it was just me and my uncle at the shop. In India, frequent power cuts were very common during summers and thus there were no fans or AC running. Both tempers and temperatures were running high at the shop that day. It was then that the villain of our story, Mr. Karen made his entry. He was a local resident and a regular. He seemed angry from the onset when he barged into the shop. He took a look at the fans and saw that they weren't running, then angrily picked up a 500 GM pack of samosas and asked, how many samosas are in this thing? That's 500 GMS, I said. I said how many, not how much, Mr. Karen literally screamed, again, how many in this? 56, I replied immediately since, you know, I packed them. How can you be so sure? You didn't even count. You're trying to cheat me, Mr. Karen was now in full-scale Karen mode. I demand you pack me 500 GMS of those individual ones, and don't you dare cheat me again. I looked over at my uncle, what with sweat, fanning himself with yesterday's newspaper. He slowly nodded. I beamed a huge smile, sure sir. Whatever you want. So I took a bag, picked up some samosas and started putting them on the balance. I kept counting samosas as I put them in until they were a little over 500 GMS. Then I removed the last samosa and the weight fell below 500. Now, keeping eye contact with Mr. Karen, I crushed the samosa and started putting its powdery remains in the bag until it was exactly 500 GMS. But wait, there's more. Mr. Karen apparently didn't seem to mind powdered samosa, but instead asked smugly, so how many samosas now? 48, I claimed triumphantly. You see, sometime in the past, my uncle's old chef retired, and the new chef made samosas with a little bit more filling in them. They looked the same size on the outside and only weighed a couple grams more each and since he made them in bulk and also sold to other shops in the area, the price wasn't too much of an issue. So my uncle let it slide. But those couple grams added up on mass orders, and that is what Mr. Karen found out the hard way. He looked sheepishly at the pre-packed samosas, and then at his own package, and asked if he could buy the former instead. No, my nephew made a package specially for you, at your own request. So that is what you have to buy, my uncle finally spoke. Mr. Karen silently took his pack, paid and left. He was a lot more respectful during his subsequent visits. I was reminded of this story yesterday when my PS3 finally died. 
As evident, English is not my first language, in fact, it's not even my third. So please excuse any mistakes. Absolutely, we'll do that for you. I worked a night job at a college for a few years. The job itself wasn't the worst many nights there was time for me and my partner to work on classwork or watch movies but the place itself and management were terrible. We had a jack-of-all-trades job, as most night shifters do. We'd get calls regarding just about anything, as the thousands of phone lines eventually all rolled over to us. We were also responsible for monitoring security systems and letting guards know about requests, often to unlock an area for someone or for a report of people being where they shouldn't be, but there were plenty of calls regarding the students. We had separate management from the guards. While management wasn't good by any means, the setup was good because we often butted heads with the guards, they regularly tried to refuse to respond to uninteresting service requests, for example. There was a lot of animosity. QR manager, rightfully, getting shit-canned. They had the bite idea of merging management structures, and it went even more poorly than we expected. We constantly butted heads with the guard's manager, and it worsened by the night. Eventually it got to the point where the manager was being malicious, imposing all sorts of new rules. Most were more of an insult than a concern for us, as we were in a separate office and had cameras showing anyone coming near it. We could tab out of Netflix or shove our textbooks under the desk when someone was nearing. She sensed this and declared that we were being lazy with parts of our job and said we should not wait to send a guard for service to a door alarm. And that's where it got fun. You see, most campuses nowadays, on the low end, have hundreds of electronically monitored doors. The system knows when the building closes and will let you know if a door is opened after that, if someone forces a door, at any time, if a door is being held open, etc. And the manager wasn't wrong there were, especially early in the night shift, a lot of active alarms. But my partner and I were good at our jobs. We knew that there were plenty of doors that were broken and wouldn't shut all the way, or that sometimes there are stragglers in a building that leave 10 minutes after close. If there was an alarm in a sensitive area or one that wasn't common, we'd send a guard to check it out, but for the common doors, we'd wait until a guard was doing rounds and give them the list of doors that needed to be closed more securely which some knew by heart because it really was that common. Sure thing, we'll send for every alarm. I think there were five guards that night, and we had more than 15 alarms right off the bat. Adding to that, there were a number of doors that were just flat out broken and throughout the entire night would, for less than a second, show as open and then shut. Doesn't matter. The guard who was just there and is now responding to another door that we know is broken can go right back to it. Three hours and I had guards calling me, begging to stop with the doors, some were ready for their nap. Four hours and the manager came and asking what the heck was going on. We explained that there were many broken or malfunctioning doors, and for things that were known issues, we just dealt with it when the guards got there and let them know it needed to be shut. She pressed for more information until we offered her copies of the emails we sent about malfunctions, requesting repairs. Her experiment didn't even last the whole night, we were told to go back to normal. She backed off a bit after that. Make sure the salad is well dressed? You got it. I was reminded of this story, as I'm eating a salad right now, so I decided to share. Many years ago, I worked for a very nice restaurant. We weren't high class or anything, but we were very nice, especially for the area. We had a few regulars that would come in for business meetings, or special dates, etc. And for the most part, everyone was courteous, etc. We did have an extensive wine collection, as the owner was a fan of wine and loved to share that with people. So, it would occasionally bring in some serious snobs. I love wine, but something about those that are truly passionate make them either incredible human beings or absolutely insufferable. Mike, a business regular, was one of the insufferable ones. He liked to bring prospective clients in to impress them with the wine and his snootiness. He was also one of the few people that would spend a lot of money in one sitting, tax write-off purposes, I'm sure, make a grand show of tipping 35% or higher, and then slipping it back into his pocket after the client left. 
Not all of it, but regularly only left about 2% or less. One evening he calls and makes a reservation. For 12. This is very unusual, as usually it was only him and one or two other people. Mike pulled out all the stops and actually ordered and paid ahead of time, as he wanted minimal interruptions. He picked four menu items of similar value that his guests could pick from, pre-ordered appetizers, desserts, and nine bottles of wine. The total before tax was close to $2,000. We were supposed to keep interactions to a minimum, but he wanted us to fill waters and sodas the moment they're half full, clear plates the moment someone is finished, bring fresh wine glasses every time someone has finished a glass and don't let him ever catch someone refiling their own glass or using the same one. We were to be seen, not heard, and were to somehow supposed to magically anticipate what everyone needed. He left a $25 tip when he prepaid. This was before the mandatory tips for groups of XX or larger. So, the day arrives. And I came over first, introduced myself, explained that their host had prepaid for a set menu. The wine and appetizers would be out shortly and I was there to take orders for any other drinks that may be wanted, what dressing they would like for their salad, and which of the four menu items each person would like. I went around the table, getting everyone's selections. I came to the head of the table, and asked Mike what his preference for salad dressing would be. He was extremely snippy with me when he said, blue cheese, and make sure the salad is well. Dressed, in his usual flashy show of authority to impress the people around him, with a very perturbed look on his face, since I dared to even speak at the table. At this point, I had it with Mike. I had already been hired at a new job, and had already put in my two weeks notice. Hence why I was selected for Mike duty. I get to the back and I'm just. So over all of it. I'm prepping the salads and it happens. I get to Mike's salad. Well dressed, you say. You. Got. It buddy. I took the mini suit off the bottle of wine that the boss's wife had sewn as a gag, put it around a pint glass from the bar, and placed Mike's salad inside the glass, and brought that out to him. In front of what was sure to be a life-changing business deal. I made sure to slip in silently, drop off salads in front of people deftly. Then made a point to set his down in front of him last, when there was a natural pause in the sales pitch. And clearly state, you're well. Dressed. Salad, sir. Laughs were had, by all but Mike. The rest of the night went off without a word spoken between the guests and I. When they left, several of the guests had left a few dollar dollar here and there, tucked under plates. I finished off my last week there without incident. Thanks for watching.